Welcome. We're glad to have you with us tonight for our discussion of Winter's Bone. A very heavy movie, uh, but a very interesting one uh, that uh, my colleague Jacob suggested and made a wonderful, uh, thoughtful introduction for and is here to uh, lead us in discussing. So we're glad to have him here. Uh, for those of you who uh, might need a little bit of a reminder just to mention, uh, please keep your audio muted um, until I call on you. Uh, I will call on you if you have a question or comment because you will raise your hand using the raise hand function within Zoom. You can see it on your screen there by the number two. And then I will call on people in the order that they appear on the list of hands raised. I see we already have a couple of people, which is great. Uh, and we will try to get to everybody. Uh, we might not get to people coming back for a second bite but uh, at the Apple, but we will try to get to everyone at least once. Uh, also, please use the chat function within Zoom to introduce yourself, to chat with other participants, uh, to raise uh, questions or make comments that you don't think exactly uh, maybe fit the ongoing verbal discussion. Uh, and we will bring them into that discussion if, uh, uh, if, if they seem appropriate to do so. Um, if you are from outside southeastern Pennsylvania and want to let us know where you're from, as I said, you can do that in the chat, or you can visit the Where in the World uh, section uh, within Film Studies Online at BrynMarFilm.org to send us a note, let us know uh, how you found us and how we're doing and uh, where you are joining us from. And uh, with all that said, I think we are ready to begin our discussion. So let's see here. Uh, Robert, looks like you're first up. Robert. Well, thanks. I didn't expect to be called first, but um, what I thought was, or questions that I had. Um, I know Jacob, I mean, yeah, Jacob had said that this was sort of the documentary style, but yet it wasn't a documentary. And it made me think of the other film that we saw as a class that Paul Wright told us the same thing. It looked like a documentary, but it wasn't a documentary. And that film was The Battle of Algiers. And I thought to myself, why did I like The Battle of Algiers so much more than I like this film? And I sort of thought that what bothered me about this film is, and, and I liked, of course, the acting was fantastic, I, I, but I'm not gonna go there. What I, I found difficult what, or, or I, was that there was no rhythm in the editing. And what I mean by that is, it seemed like every shot was the same length of time no variation um and um the whole thing was um the main character jennifer lawrence was in every single shot i believe and so what we had was a subjective camera subjective point of view and i guess i just found it um a little bit irritating um and I just, as somebody who would do this film over again, I guess I thought to myself, wouldn't it have been wonderful if Jessup, I guess, was that the father? Um, yes, that's right. Jessup, what if Jessup had been a character in this film? Why not? He seemed like an interesting guy. And then this other guy, Thump, uh, is a very interesting character. We just saw him for a couple of seconds and I thought to myself, boy, if I were doing this film, I would make this really, really exciting. I mean, with much more character development and we wouldn't just be focused only on Jennifer Lawrence really. And anyway, those are my thoughts. Thank you. All right, Robert. Uh, 
Thanks for that. Uh, Jacob, do you want to go first or should I? Um, I'll speak to a couple things, Robert. Well, thanks for checking out the movie. Um, and I, I'm glad you got some stuff out of it, even if it, uh, the whole thing wasn't to your taste. Um, I'll, I'll just speak to sort of my experience of it, which is um, one of the, I'll, I'll, I'll try to articulate a couple things about the movie that I appreciate that I think sort of connect with some of the things that you've talked about. Um, one is a sort of um, sense of the pacing. And a thing that I like very much about this movie, or I think is at least a sort of interesting storytelling move is that um, this is essentially kind of a, uh, uh, in a detective film, we would call it a cherche la femme plot, but you know, um, it's about, it's a search for a missing person. And there are elements of the film that, you know, come up along the way that add to that sort of thriller narrative. But yet the film sort of keeps, it doesn't go whole hog into like the fast paced thriller mode. It sort of stays in a kind of slow burn. And to me that made it feel um, all the more effective because we really get a sense of this world. We get a sense of the pace of this world. You know, this is a place where Rhi is walking everywhere. And so there is time passing and, uh, and the mystery unravels slowly. And this sort of even pacing of it, to me at least, and just in, in, in sort of my experience of the film, made that sort of crescendo on the, uh, on the moonlit lake all the more effective. Now, let me also speak to the, the world building, as it were. Um, again, you know, there's certainly, I think, elements of the film where, uh, in characters that, that show up, where um, I would certainly be interested in learning more about those characters too. Um, uh, to me, that's a virtue, or it's something that I appreciate about the film. A thing that I'm very fond of when I watch a film, whether it's a thriller or whether it is a social drama or whether it's anything else, is a sense that in that life keeps going when the camera moves. You know that this is really a world that feels alive. And you know, I think in this film, we can imagine many of the characters having lives and having you know um, full universes like behind the doors that we don't get to go through, which I think makes it feel really fleshed out. Now I would add just one more thing, which is um, I don't want to treat the book and the film uh, as, you know, one in the same text, they're different texts. But um, if you are indeed interested in, uh, and you did want to spend more time with these characters, the book, which is quite good, um, builds the stories of some of these characters uh, in a more fleshed out way than happens in the film. And that I think would be appropriate to happen in the film, but there is a bigger world for you to explore if you're inclined to do so. I'll kick it to you, Andrew. Um, filmmaking's about choices. And uh, we tend to focus at least, um, I tend to focus, I guess, because a lot of times people are more interested in close textual readings. I tend to focus on um, more direct, specific choices, such as why is this character framed this way or that way, or why is the camera at this angle versus that angle? But the first choice, or one of the first choices when making a movie is what story am I going to tell? And if that, if the movie is adapted from uh, another work, a novel, then if it's a novel, it, the, one of the choices is what parts of the story am I going to tell or what elements of the story am I going to include? Because it's, you can't, you can't really effectively turn a, the entirety of a novel into a single feature film. Um, so I think the choice that was made here was to tell Ree's story and to tell the elements of the story that don't directly affect her from her point of view. And, and that's a choice. I think what Robert and some others in the chat are, are saying about this movie is ultimately uh, um, uh, a desire on their part to just see a different movie. Um, I think that you're, you're right that um, Paul Wright said about Battle of Algiers that it had a documentary look to it. And Jacob said fairly about this film that it has the same, but that is an aesthetic. That is not, uh, that is a look to the, primarily to the cinematography. Um, 
And in particular, Algiers had newsreel footage and similar things to try to emulate. And this, this movie, for obvious reasons, doesn't have those things. Um, but I think saying that expecting two movies that both have something approaching a documentary aesthetic to be the same as like expecting, you know, Independence Day and Solaris to be the same because they both involve spaceships. Um, it's true that they do, but that's one tiny point of similarity or small point of similarity. And there's a lot of room for the other, for other areas of divergence. Um, I think as some people have been saying in the chat, you know, this was a choice. Re was not in, this is an opportunity to clarify something. Re was not in every shot. She may have been in every scene. And I think she probably was in every scene, but she was not in every shot. Um, to be fair though, I, I think the point was that, that Robert was making is that we are seeing things through her perspective and the shots of the other people that we saw that she wasn't in were things we saw largely from her, from her perspective. Um, and that's because this is her story. We're meant to feel her pressure. We're meant to identify with this, this girl or young woman, depending on, on, you know, I guess your relative age and perspective. Um, and, and that was a choice and it may not have, it may have made it difficult for some people to identify or appreciate, um, but that was the choice. And I think to an extent, we need to judge the film based on that, that premise. Um, I think to wish this story gave us more teardrop, for example, or we learn more about teardrops life um, isn't, entire, isn't entirely a fair criticism because I don't think the movie was endeavoring to give us much insight into anyone um, other than Re. Let's see, uh, Jean, you have a question or comment. Yes, hi, Robert and Andrew. I mean, not Robert and Andrew, uh, Jacob and Andrew. Um, thank you for, for uh, bringing this film back. Uh, I, I have a very different take on it than Robert did, um, and I guess that's the beauty of these conversations. But I, um, I don't think I've seen it since it first came out, and I figured, all right, well, I'm, I'm going to put it on while I'm doing some other things, just to remind myself all about it before the conversation. And I just couldn't take my eyes away from it. And I think what I love so much about it is that it's a, the kind of film I, I just like to live inside of. They, they set up an environment that feels so authentic. And I know I've read things about how the crew lived in these communities where there was very little they had to change, I believe, about the sets. Um, and so you, it's not only is that authentic, but I think they also hired lots of local talent and even non-actors. And it reminded me of how, for example, like Arthur Penn used local talent for Bonnie and Clyde and things like that that really helped make it seem authentic and real. And so I was just happy I didn't even necessarily need the whole Cherche La Femme, but because I just, there are movies where I just like to exist in them for a while. And you could tell there were details in there that only would have come from living in an environment like that for a while. Like the one that stood out was just when Re goes to the home of her sister and then says to the husband, not the sister, are you going to invite me in? As if it's maybe in that, in that society, you know, even though it seems like the women are in charge, the men still have that role of power and that they may have to be the ones to grant you that kind of uh, entry, for example. So that's what I, that's, those are some of the big things I took from this. Well, uh, thank you for those comments, Gene. Um, I think that uh, it is it's interesting because we sort of have in our, our first two comments, two very different views of what one can expect from a movie, right? Um, uh, Robert, to be fair, was um, looking for more plot and more, um, 
you know, inclusion and contributions from other characters and more sort of specific elements to kind of um, latch on to narratively and, and sort of character wise. And, and Gene was saying he was very happy to just sort of for the sense of atmosphere that was created. And um, that's one of the great things about movies. And it's one of the things that can be very challenging about movies, particularly for filmmakers, right? Is that um, we want, each of us wants and gets different things from different movies, but trying to make a movie that's, if not all things to all people, something for all people, you can see how that's quite a challenge. And part of it is on us as viewers to try to get a sense of, is this movie gonna give me what I'm looking for? But uh, by the same token, the filmmakers and the entities that fund and support and distribute, et cetera, the movies, I would think have some obligation or we have a right to have some expectation that they will try to convey an accurate sense or an appropriate sense of what the film will be like. And I think that we can all think of examples where that's been done successfully and where it hasn't been done so successfully. Jacob. Uh, thanks for your comment, Gene. Um, I, uh, my experience of the film and that's sort of just soaking into the world and, and just sort of being present there and exploring it um, also felt very rich. It's one of the things that I also like about the film. I also like that you brought up this sort of strange intricate gender roles in the film. I know that's not your comment, but it, perhaps it's, a, uh, it's well observed and perhaps it's a subject we can return to in this conversation. Um, I think you articulated uh, what uh, is special about that quality of the film very well. So I'll just try to fill in a couple, I think, interesting details. Um, you are correct that the filmmakers really embedded in uh, this community it was filmed in two counties on the Missouri Arkansas border. Um, the houses that you see, um, both the interiors and the exteriors were houses um, of people who lived in the region. For example, I remember um, in the director's commentary, Deborah Granick notes that in Teardrop's house, in a shot you can see his refrigerator and there's like stuff stuck up on there with magnets. And Deborah Granick, the director was saying, we didn't set dresses. This is just stuff that was on the refrigerator and on the cat and you know the stuff that's on the counter was the stuff that was on the counter when they came there. So it has this real sense of um, being a lived in space because it is a lived in space. Um, similarly, some of the actors did, you know, immersion, uh, immersion sorts of preparation. John Hawks, excuse me, who played Teardrop, uh, discusses in interviews how he would go to bars, like rough bars in the area and just hang out there to see if he could sort of blend into the, into the background. Um, and also many of the actors who you see in the film are people from the area. Um, one worth mentioning is Ray's youngest sister, Ashley. Uh, this was the daughter of the family whose house was borrowed for Ray's house. Um, she was somebody who actually lived in that house and they liked her. And so they kept, the role was in fact uh, originally to be um, a male role, but they liked this girl who lived in this house. And so they changed it to include her in the film. Um, the character who plays Thump Milton um, uh, was a guy from the area too, um, a Vietnam vet. And you see him wearing this biker jacket that says like, you know, it has all these patches on them, one of which says Vietnam veteran. And that was his real biker jacket. And that fellow whose name escapes me, right? Ron something, um, was the subject of Granick's next film, which was called Stray Dog. And it's a documentary about this fellow living in the Ozarks who's sort of trying to build a life and dealing with his post-traumatic stress disorder. So this is a community they really took an interest in and they really embedded in. Uh, Joss, you have a question or comment? Uh, yes, um, I love this movie the first time I saw it when it first came out and uh, on another watching, um, got a whole lot more out of it, it's wonderful. Um, I certainly want to echo Gene's comments about authenticity. These, these people and places felt real. And, um, and, then, and that credit for that, I'm sure, goes to the director um, and, the, and the choices about that. Um, it was almost as if, maybe, and it was as if the the actors in the primary roles were sort of inserted into this, into this world and had to work their way through it. Um, as I was watching it, I had the sense that this was not so much a, 
a mystery, uh, la femme or cherche la pair as it was as it was in this film. But only, but a quest. It wasn't just to find her father. She knew her father. She knew that it was very likely her father was dead. Um, but she had. She was doing all this to save her family. So it, it took on a, a much greater scope, I think, in that regard. Um, I have a lot to say, and I don't want to take up too much time. So the one other thing I wanted to bring up was was, was Jennifer Lawrence's role here. When I first saw this film, nobody had ever seen her before. And I figured she was just some kid from the Ozarks that they found to play this role because she just fit right in and seemed so good in it. <clears throat> and, and then when she, when she appeared in The Hunger Games, she was almost playing the same character in a different, well, a similar setting actually at the beginning. Um, the same stoicism, the same rural poverty, uh, the same day-to-day -day survival ethic. Um, and um, I was, okay, so they found this kid who did this thing and they have her doing it, doing it again. And uh, because it fits the role that, that it fits the character they need for this big block bus, blockbuster film. And then came her later films, the next couple of films after that, Silver Linings Playbook, uh, which was just weird. And again, she was amazing in a completely different role. And I finally realized, wow, this is an actor. And then, and then had incredible comic role in American Hustle. Um, so I think a lot of credit goes to her for inhabiting this character of Re in this film. Um, anyway, those were some observations. Thanks, Joss. Um, I would say that I've never, uh, I've never thought she, I didn't think as much of some of those later movies as, as a lot of people did. And I, I never thought she, um, I mean, there might be one or two examples escaping me, but by and large, I would say she never acted again as well as she did in this movie. Um, and well, well that, that, and you may be right. My, my point was that she was so different in those other films mm -hmm. that it, it brought to light the fact that she was acting in this movie. Yeah. And I, I think the, the thing that, you know, none of us who, who are seeing this now can separate Jennifer Lawrence, the actress from Jennifer Lawrence, the movie star. And um, so it's sort of impossible to know, uh, but whether, you know, whether it would come later or not, this was a part where uh, in, in this film, she really, you know, there was no, there was no wall there. There was no star. You didn't see a star acting like a person from this place going through these things. And I think part of that, given what's come of her career over the last several years, I think a lot of the credit to my mind would go to Deborah Granick because um, I think we've seen her give uh, direct um, lots of different people to lots of really good performances. Some of them, um, also new people or people relatively new to motion picture acting. Some of them people who have acted for, been acting for years, but perhaps maybe never as effectively as they do when, when working with her. So um, I, I give Deborah Granick a lot of credit. Uh, Jacob, did you have any comments on Joss's remarks? Um, I'll, I'll just reiterate what both of you have said, which is that this is, I think really a special performance from Jennifer Lawrence. Um, you know, as, as we've discussed, she really anchors this film and, um, and she's up against some, some other very formidable actors. So, I mean, I think uh, one understands why she became a star, you know, looking at this film and I'll leave it there. Uh, I just want to say going forward, we have a lot of people with their hands up, which is wonderful, wonderful. So, but I just would ask people to try to please keep their questions or comments um, as, as to the point as possible so we can get everybody heard at least once. That would be appreciated. Uh, let's see, Barbara Casper, you're next.
Okay. Um, uh, Judy Kinderman, you're next. Hi. Can you hear Hi, me? Judy. Andrew? Yep. Hi. Go ahead, Judy. Okay. So I will, uh, I won't take too long, but uh, I will say that this is a lovely, lovely film. Thank you for picking it tonight uh, for us to review. Um, I think um, a couple of things. I think it accomplishes an awful lot uh, in, uh, in a spare uh, in a spare way. It accomplishes uh, a sense of place uh, where, as was mentioned before, where we understand where we are thoroughly, uh, we understand the region. But I also think it's much larger than that. I think that, um, I think Jennifer Lawrence's character has her own sense of what's right and what, uh, of justice, and that she goes on this quest uh, to prove herself right, and she comes up against ancient uh, traditions and, and, um, and history and, and things that she must com combat and, and she succeeds. So I think the movie has, uh, takes us to a much, takes, is a much larger scale, almost a morality uh, scale, a morality story. I also wanna add that I think the gender issue has been mentioned. I feel that the, uh, the women in this film uh, were very much afraid of the men in the film. It was almost palpable. I felt it every time she entered a house. Uh, she, they, she could sort of sense that there was this fear that these women were not going to step out of place. And I think that's part of why, uh, that's part of what made her quest so amazing as a young girl is she did this and she accomplished what she set out to do. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, thanks for those comments, uh, Judy. I think that you have touched on a number of really important elements of the movie. I'll, I'll, I'll let Jacob remark on some of them in just a second, but the one I wanna comment on is how you talked about, you used the word spare. And I think a lot of times that is, um, sometimes people think that's a substitute for, that a, a film is kind of, kind of lacking things. And I think here the film conveys what it wants to convey, but it does it with an economy of filmmaking techniques. I think about the sense of menace that we all um, got from certain characters, whether it was Teardrop or whether it was some of the, the other folks and how that in other films that would have been conveyed with a sound, with music, with menacing music or um, really extreme camera angles or some other techniques. And here, it really, a lot of it came from the reactions of the other characters. A lot of it came from the stillness that the understated, you know, depiction resulted in, which suggests a sense of concern or pause. Um, I, I think that that was, that is really, you know, one of the strengths of the, of the movie. Jacob. I concur, Andrew. Um, I, and, and I think you're spot on, Judy. Uh, this is a film, I think, that operates really deftly in a lot of different registers simultaneously. You know, we've talked about the element of it that sort of has a social realist element, um, where it's rendering uh, tangibly a very specific sense of place. We've talked about the mystery, thriller, detective, uh, structure a little bit, but it's also um, earlier, it was mentioned that there's a sort of hero's quest in here. There's a journey of discovery. There's a coming of age story in here. Um, there's also a sort of mythic element to it. I think there's some really clear uh, resonances with um, folkloric structures like myths or fairy tales. You know, if you know the Greek story of Antigone, um, the uh, heroine who's uh, brother has been killed, but the king is ordered that he not be buried, and she has to go set out to give her brother a proper burial. This is a classic Greek, uh, Greek myth, and there's a shade of that in the film as well. There's a fairy tale element to it in some ways, I think. Um, you know, the story of um, a character sets off into the woods to save the family farm is, a, is an old story. It's also a Southern Gothic narrative uh, in certain ways. It's certainly delves into that genre's um, engagement with history and culture and the burdens of family and inheritance, as well as the grotesque elements of the genre and certain elements. Um, 
So I think it covers a lot of ground deftly uh, and without um, being um, histrionic or, 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 or uh, without tipping its hand too much. Um, so, so thank you for that comment, that observation. I mean, I think in a way to make a very, you know, sort of, I don't want to say overstated, but a very direct and overt uh, film about this region and this story would kind of be um, at odds with the nature of the, the subculture that's being depicted. Um, because so much of the, <laughs> there's so much value put on being quiet and knowing one's boundaries and so on and so forth that to make a film in a style that didn't seem to adhere to those would be a bit incongruous. Though perhaps an interesting exercise, but but that's not this movie. Um, Dana, you have a question or comment. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So so just a little bit more, Jennifer Lawrence. I'll be really quick. I'll talk quickly. I'll. <laughs> uh, I, I I just agree with you, Andrew, and I rarely do, but I think she's a very special kind of an actor. And um, I saw this film after I saw Silver Linings Playbook because I thought she was so great and because of Silver Linings Playbook. So I wanted to see where she started. But I wanna say a couple of things about her as in, in relation to other women actors, particularly in, in the films that we've been watching throughout this long period of film watching we've been doing on Monday night. She's a very different kind of performer. Um, and, and she's to me extremely intriguing. First of all, she's so very modern. She's so very much more now than a lot of the classically trained actors that we've seen or people who came out of the actor studio or um, any number of other kinds of training. And the interesting thing about her is she has absolutely no training. She actually dropped out of middle school and never got a GED. So she is an untrained, totally untrained actor, which gives me pause. So it makes me wonder about where all this is coming from. The way I sort of see her, and I just, again, I, I won't dwell on it. She's got this marvelous taciturn core, something that is so opaque in the, in the, the depth of her that works so well with Ree and also works with many of the other characters that she plays. And it's the outward parts of things that she does, which give, give life to the character, but you never, ever, ever really know what she's thinking. You never really know what's motivating her other than the very obvious things. And I think she's really, really, really good at that and pulls it off very well. There are two scenes in this movie that I think really show that up and are spectacular. Um, and in, those, in these two scenes, she actually comes almost to the point of allowing that core to show. One of them is in the scene where she's uh, with the army recruiting center where the lighting of the scene is different and therefore she looks very different from the way she looks in her Ozark neighborhood. And she seems like she is a fish out of water and she behaves that way. And I almost thought this little girl and suddenly she was a little girl to me, not a young woman. She was a little girl and she was ready to cry as much as Jennifer Lawrence could bring herself to cry when she realized that she was not gonna be able to get the $40,000 that she would be, get, be able to get in the army. So that was really an interesting scene. The other scene, which is so memorable to me, is the scene that of course nobody will forget who's ever seen this movie where she's in the boat and she reaches down and she, you know, to get her father's hands. She does something that every actor trains to do in every acting class in the world and never gets a chance to do. It's called the silent scream. Um, where you scream with all of your might and, and no sound comes out. Nobody ever gets a chance to use that in a role, but Jennifer Lawrence, whether she were the, or the director, got her to do that. And for that moment, the entire core almost was able to come exploding out and it didn't. So for those reasons and for many other, I, I think she is the, the heart and soul of this film. I don't think it would be anything like it, it turned out being without the acting that she does and has done since as well. So my, 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 my love, I, I love the, the, the Cherche La Jennifer. <laughs> well, thank you, Dana. Um, I have nothing to, to say to that, except that um, what I know about Dana's um, experience as uh, experience with and interest in acting, um, I would certainly, I certainly give her thoughts on matters like this um, a tremendous amount of weight. And um, 
So it, it might cause me to, to rethink uh, Jennifer Lawrence next time I see her in a movie, um, but I'm still not going to go run out and do that. Um, but Jacob, did you have any thoughts based on what Dana was saying? Certainly, yeah. Excellent. Uh, very well observed, Dana. Um, and I agree. I think, you know, how many films have you seen where the major arc of the character is that they finally make contact with their inner feelings and it's released in some cathartic explosion? You know, in some way, I'm being a little bit reductive here, but in some ways this is what method acting, which is one of the dominant paradigms of performance over the last, you know, 60 to 70 years of, of, of Hollywood has, is oriented around. Um, and, uh, and oftentimes that's the elements of characters that actors sort of um, zero in on you know, finding that inner suppressed emotional core and finding a way to let it out. And Jennifer Lawrence does not do that. She focuses on actions. Um, she focuses on keeping it in. And she gives us the sense that this is somebody caring a lot inside themselves, but who is focused on just getting from one thing to the next to the next. And there are these, I think you articulated two, uh, two moments where we see it come close to the surface. Um, uh, and I'll add one more, which is there's, I think, a, a great but understated scene where she has a um, uh, uh, teardrop has advised her that she should sell the woods um, that that is on their family's land before they lose the house because they're just going to get sold anyway. At that point in the film, it seems like she has no options. She's her back against the wall and no more leads. And she goes into the woods near her house with her mother who is semi catatonic and she says mom what should i do just once just once tell me what i should do um but we have the sense sort of to me at least that part of the reason that she can let go of herself enough to be that vulnerable and to ask that question and to ask for help is because she knows that her mother isn't going to isn't going to uh to give her anything you know, um, it's an intimate relationship to be sure and somebody who she feels comfortable with. And we have a sense of the bond between them, even with her mother's state. But, um, but that's, I think, a really uh, compelling and moving moment of the film as well. Uh, Janet, you have a question or comment. Hi, thanks. I'm glad to be here discussing this movie with you. Thank you, Jacob and Andrew. Um, I love the mentions of uh, it being folklore-like. Uh, this world, my goodness, it might be another planet. Um, but uh, I noticed that the film began and ended with shots of the children playing. And I wonder if that might not be a hopeful element. And then I watched all the way through the end of the credits and saw that young girl, the little sister, Ashley, being focused on. So that was interesting to learn that she was there in the community. Um, what a violent uh, place. A sociologist would have fun observing the structure they've created for themselves. Um, but at the same time, the first moment that violence actually happens is our teardrop who grows on us. But the first moment when I jumped, he grabs her by the throat in his own kitchen. You know, that was scary. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'll mention two books that uh, also cover this type of, um, well, situation where meth is being made, there's little hope, they're, they're just on another planet, like I said. Um, Hillbilly Elegy, which maybe we just saw the television thing, I didn't, but they, the criticism of that was that they didn't get the poverty authentically enough. This film got the poverty very authentically. The other book, uh, I can recommend it if you don't know it, Educated, by Tara Westover, slightly different, but it it's the story of her life when she does end up going to college, but her childhood is just horrendous. But I don't have a question here, but I'd love to hear any of your thoughts about the children or the hope. Uh, thank you very much, Janet. Yeah, I have to say that um, I was reminded that um, I found the ending the very ending of the film to be relative to the rest of the film, like shockingly upbeat. I wouldn't consider that an upbeat ending for, for almost any other movie, but I was 
I was gratified and, uh, you know, to see anything approaching a glimmer of hope or frankly, at least stability or a sense that the danger was over. And I, I think we get that. And I think it's a, it's a small favor. I was thanking the, the movie heavens for, but I think that that's pro those are probably the favors that, that those characters get when they get any Jacob. Yeah. Let me talk about the, the kids too. I'm, I'm glad you've um, picked up on that and, and, and brought that to the table. So one of the things that I think the film does structurally is we begin this journey kind of into the grimiest, uh, darkest parts of this particular uh, community. Um, but as, and, and if one wasn't watching closely, um, it would be easy to say, well, this is just, you know, an out and out grim place. Um, and there are certainly that those elements to it. But there are also things that I think Granick really deliberately puts in our path along the way that show us the other sides of this community and this culture. Um, uh, we see them both on character levels. As you say, Teardrop grows on us as we learn more about him and there are other characters who I think um, flesh out as we go through. Certainly Jessup as well when we see his, you know, the, the photo album at the end. Um, but we also see the sort of rich culture of this region. And we see, um, uh, I think the most prominent example is the music, um, particularly in that house party scene where we see um, people uh, playing the music of the region uh, and doing that for their own entertainment and carrying on that tradition. And I think one is inclined to say, well, this is something precious that they have here that deserves to be preserved and that is special. Um, so I bring this up to say, um, when we, what we see at the end of the film is uh, Ashley picking up the banjo and sort of strumming it a little bit. You know, this is a film where we've had, we've engaged intensely with the burden of blood and inheritance and family pressures and family cycles, as well as social and, you know, I, I guess communal cycles. Um, and many of the, the ones that those of the Dali family are embedded in seem to lead to dark places. Um, but what we see the kid picking up at the end is a symbol, the banjo, um, which is associated with the things about the culture that are rich um, and that are enriching um, and that are, that are beautiful. So I, I do think that is uh, perhaps one way to read that is the direction that the kids are going is not towards drugs, towards crime, towards the hustle, um, but perhaps in, in, in a more enriching direction. I'll add, one more, I'll add one more detail, which comes from the book, but I think is, is interesting, which is the book gives us a piece of, the book includes, um, at the end of the book, when Re receives the bail money um, that's been returned to her, we understand, we learn that she's going, her intention is to buy a vehicle. So it's literally this, what she gains at the end is this means of movement, of transportation. So I think the implication there is that there is some sort of mobility. There is some sort of escape from this, you know, uh, bitter cycle that's implied at the end. Um, and, uh, and I think that's an interesting thing to read into it. Uh, Joan Strank, you have a question or comment. Well, people have said what I was going to say, but I was really interested in, I think it was Marib, the wife of, um, um, I forgot his name already. Uh, well, anyway, Thump's, Thump's wife. I thought she's particularly good in the expressions on her face. And at the end when, you know, not at the end, but at the scene where they take her in the rowboat and, and Jennifer Lawrence takes her off one hand of her father. She's, oh, no, no, you got to get the other one too. It was the expression. I thought she was a great actress. I just wanted to comment on that. Okay, thank you, Joan. Can I, can I make a comment uh, sure. about that, Andrew? Sure. One thing that I think is interesting there as we, as we watch those ones, you know, she has to go through this process of holding her father's hands while uh, Mara removes them. Um, she goes through it twice. Um, the first time we see that silent scream that, uh, that Dana mentioned, which is wrenching. 
The second time she stays composed. And part of what's going on in this film is a coming of age arc. You know, somebody passing from innocence into experience. And for Re and for somebody in Re's position in her community, what that means is a sort of composure and self-reliance. And, you know, again, I think it's a testament to Jennifer Lawrence's performance that we can see her make that transition so naturally and in such a brief period of time. Uh, Lillian, you have a question or comment. Good. Okay. Um, I, I, I was glad to hear Jacob's last comment about the book and the fact that uh, Re might get a, a vehicle at the end of the story, because one of the things that impressed me in this movie was the showing her trudging by foot back and forth and up and down those hills as she went from one place to another looking for people or trying to find help or looking to somebody who might give her a clue as to where her father might be. I, 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 was, I, I was watching that and, and it, it just struck me that the director did a wonderful job with that to show her persistence and how hard everything really had to be for her. And the role of the women, um, I've I, I, I been trying to figure it out. I, I, I had a feeling that the women in some way, they're trying to warn her about sticking her nose into things and asking too many questions at the beginning. And yet they are the people who finally, because she wasn't listening to anybody, who beat her up and wanted to make it very clear that no man had laid a hand on her. I found that very interesting. Um, and I have to say that I was completely taken by the setting of this movie. I felt the whole time that I watched it that I had taken a trip to somewhere else where I had never been in my life. I, I thought it was a great movie. It was the first time I had seen it. I guess I missed it on the first go around. Thank you, Lillian. Um, I, I think that the, the gender dynamic in this movie and presumably that in the culture that it's depicting are, are really, really something. Um, I, I think the re sort of has, I mean, within that world, even two strikes against her. One is her relative youth. The other is that she doesn't have um, th the man in her life that, or in her immediate family unit that these other women seem to have. Now, I'm not saying that that um, would solve her problems, it wouldn't, but there's obviously a protocol within that world um, and because she doesn't have that male member of her family, she has to take on these roles and go to these places and do these things and, and stick her nose in, as somebody said, where a man otherwise, the, the man uh, representing her otherwise would have. And that makes things all the more dangerous for her. It's also an opportunity for us to see all just how even more courageous and determined she is. Um, but I mean, so there's that element within the movie that sets her apart from the already interesting gender dynamics that the rest of the film is sort of showing us about that, about that, that place. Jacob. Right. I, I'm glad that I'm glad that we have a chance to discuss this a little bit. And I know it came up before, too. So I'm glad we've made our way back around. Um, right. So this is a world where, as Andrew, you use the word protocol, and I think that's a really good word. There seem to be really prescribed uh, gender roles. Um, and uh, and, and um, I recall somebody mentioned this, but when she's um, when Rhi is visiting her friend, she has to be invited in by the man of the house. Um, uh, when she goes to visit Thump Milton's family, um, Merib asks her, you know, don't you have any men who can do this? And I think the implication is traditionally the, 
for somebody to go speak to the head of the household, the male head of the household, it would be a man who does it. Similarly, as you mentioned, Lillian, um, it seems significant that only the women lay a hand on her, you know, um, when Teardrop asks, shows up to sort of rescue her after she's been uh, uh, knocked around, um, uh, Mira makes it clear that none of the men have, um, have touched her. And I think the implication is that it's sort of within the rules of that underworld culture that only the women can, can hurt her and the men can't. Um, so this is certainly a, um, wor a, a, a world with a strong patriarchal element. Um, and it's certainly, we can see that it's underwritten by violence in certain circumstances. You know, you remember Teardrop uh, threatening his, his partner, his wife with, with violence at one point, very menacing, very scary. Um, but there's also the sense that women wield power in certain ways too. Um, there is a sort of network of, of women that get certain things done. Um, I recall um, the character Megan, she's, she's the, the, the youngish girl who initially meets Re on Thump Milton's property, gives Re a hint. There's a sort of sense of solidarity and common cause there. And she kind of helps her along until duty calls upon her to, you know, to, uh, to beat her up too. Um, similarly, it's, it's the women who take her, who take Re to find her father. And it seemed to be the women who've made the call to do that. They're not just executing it, they've made the decision. So they're, you know, Mara has real authority in some way too. So it's complicated. I mean, this is one of the things that's interesting about the film is it it's not one way only. Right, and the women, I mean, the women are clearly gatekeepers too. Uh, they just, they have a lot to say about who gets access to the house, who gets access. I mean, so when, when Ree goes to her sister's house, she does ask her sister's husband if she can come in, but she first has to clear the sister, right? Um, and all the other places, right. I'm sorry, friend, right. But all the other places, um, all the other places, you know, there are these women who are gatekeepers and there's, there's a lot of, you know, authority in that because implicit in that is that the man they're protecting trusts their judgment to, to a considerable degree. And I, I think you're right to point out, Jacob, the complexity. It's not as simple, you know, you know, men in charge of this, women in charge of this, men bad, women good. It's a, it's a very, you know, it's a complicated set of traditions and customs and, um, and it, that's what makes it interesting, absolutely. Yeah. That said, I mean, I think you're certainly right, Andrew, to point out that one of the hurdles that Re has to clear is that she is trying to do things that in this world, as a woman, she's not expected to do. And the, the system or whatever you want to call it, the, the, the network of protocols is sort of not set up to accommodate. So, which makes her efforts all the more heroic. Yeah. Uh, Janice, uh, you have a question or comment. Yes, I do. Uh, I saw this movie before, and the first time I saw it, I was so put off by the violence and, and the scariness that I really didn't get as much out of it as I did the second time. I mean, it was just, uh, it prevented me from seeing the entirety. So it was really good that it was suggested and that I saw it again, because I, I really thought it was a wonderful movie. And uh, I very much felt, I know it was touched on before, but I felt like a fly on the wall, looking into another culture and feeling very much a part of it. Uh, and I, I was very interested in the men's and women's uh, relationships and how all of that was structured. Uh, obviously the men, the men were quite violent, I really thought, and the women had to toe the line. And in, in terms of what we were just, was just being discussed about uh, the women that beat Re up and you know, who made the decisions and all of that, I 
kind of felt that that they decided to do this. And from the very beginning, they were, there was this element of trying to actually protect her from the men's violence and that they beat her up, but they didn't kill her. And that was probably part of that was to prevent her from being killed. I mean, underneath all this violence that the women were showing, every now and then there was this little glimmer of motherliness and referring to her as a child and things that you felt like they were drawn into a situation that they would rather have not been drawn into. And I, I really felt that it was a, a wonderful movie and I got a, a sense of this culture that in so many ways is unappealing, but that you know, underneath, you know, there are things that have merit. Thanks. Thanks, Janice. Um, you, you made a couple of really interesting points there. Um, I'll start with your last one, the, the point that, you know, this culture, which, you know, I'll just say for myself, um, is, is very different from any culture I've lived in, um, although not necessarily very different from any areas that I've lived in. It hasn't been my experience. Um, I still saw elements that I won't go so far as to say are universal that I could recognize analogs to from my own experience. And I think that that's one of the, the wonderful things about art in general, that it can show, I say universality to be as a, as a shorthand, but it can show universality of things that seem so specific to an era or a place or a people. Um, and the other, the other thing it can do is it can give us this, this depiction of this ability to, you know, observe, even though it's not factual, um, to get a sense um, of places we wouldn't go and people we wouldn't meet. And, you know, the movies haven't always done this right. They haven't always done this right in their history, um, even in documentaries and in past eras and fiction films, even when trying to do right, they haven't done it right. And perhaps the time decades from now, someone will look at this movie and talk about how it was unfair to this, um, to this part of the world. But that being said, um, I have a bit more knowledge and understanding for the people in this part of the world than I did before I saw the movie, right? And we can say that about a lot of things. And to me, that's, to me, that's a net positive. Um, Jacob. Yeah, thank you for your comment. Um, I wanna expand a little bit on one point that you made about the ambivalence that uh, the women in the Thump family or Reeves relations by some connection, um, uh, the ambivalence they have about helping her. Um, there is a sense where they are uh, putting the hurt on her, as, as they say, um, and uh, protecting their family secrets and protecting this, you know, this drug operation. Um, but there's also this sense where they're interested in, invested in preserving her. And, you know, one of the elements that figures into this, so we haven't talked about a whole lot here, is that they're family too. And this is a, this is a culture and this is a, uh, community in a situation where family is really, really important. Um, but um, as with the, uh, the 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 gender dynamics, it's 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 complicated. It, it's not one thing or the other. Um, there there is a sense of family family loyalty um, and family benevolence. Um, there's also the sense that um, being a part of this family. Uh, you are obliged to aid and abet their criminal operation and that you go along with it and that you accept things and you accept, you know, what the patriarch or the matriarch uh, sends down. Um, and so this is another one of these dynamics that's sort of thorny um, that comes up in the film um, and that I think uh, weighs in on how, how that other group of women ultimately decide to deal with rape. And I, I think it's I think it's fascinating too because of course you know in many ways we only know what's normal or not normal or proper or not proper or even legal or not legal 
based on our environment. And, um, you know, this, this movie makes, um, you know, I won't say illustrates that point, but sort of relies on that truism. I mean, Ree doesn't seem to have any interest in cooking meth or engaging in other active illegal activities, what we would call crimes. But at the same time, she also has absolutely no interest in cooperating with the authorities. Um, and it's not even, I mean, it's not even a consideration. Um, right. And, you know, that is, that is part of the, the milieu that she's from. Um, and, and she'll, she'll diverge from the people around her, but only to some, you know, degree. Right. Can I, can I add yeah. one more to that, Andrew? Yeah. So there's this dynamic that's going on with the Rian, you know, where she has to figure out how family's going to play into her life. You know, she identifies herself very strongly with the family. She calls herself a dolly bread and butter, you know? Um, so there's this sense there's this one sense where she's trying to figure out how not to have a life and not to have a life for her siblings. That's like teardrops, you know, that's like her father's, um, that's like little Arthur's. But she also isn't somebody who just wants to cut and run. and just wants to, to leave, you know, leave this world behind and go start again somewhere new. You know, she's somebody who certainly appreciates and values the things about her family and her culture um, that are rich uh, and, uh, that are strengthening and that are worth preserving. So, so part of the part of the story for Re, I think, part of the thing that she's trying to work out over the course of the film is she's sort of forced to work out is how to be a Dali who's not like little Arthur. Uh, Barbara Casper, uh, do you have a question or comment? Mistake. Sorry. That's okay. Sorry about that. No problem. Uh, Roseanne, you have a question or comment. Yeah, I do. Um, I wanted to say I love this movie. And um, I read the book years ago, Andrew, and I'm glad you picked this movie. I was afraid to see it in the movies, to tell you the truth, because of the content of it. And I was afraid I was going to be depressed. You know, I grew up in an in inner city environment. And this, the book and the movie reminds me that every little neighborhood in the city is like that. They have their own culture and their own rules within that culture. And I don't care if it's, you know, inner city Philadelphia in a neighborhood, you know, Kensington, wherever, um, or the Ozarks or Appalachia, you know, they have their own code of conduct. And you know, everybody's expected to follow it. And I agree, it's usually patriarchal. So I love this movie because she wasn't concerned about that. She was concerned about survival for her, her mother and the kids in the home that they've lived in all their lives and maybe for generations. So, you know, it really did speak to me in that regard. Um, there, was, there was a question that I had, though, with regard to um, uh, the scene where she's, you know, got her hands in the lake and, you know, trying to find her father's hands uh, for Mara to cut them off. Um, <laughs> geez, that was terrible. It was terrible to read and it was terrible to see in the movie. But, um, you know, I had a different sense of it when I saw it in the movie. When I saw in the movie, her stoicism really came out in, in that, you're right, I think it was Andrew who said, um, you saw her go from this person who wanted to scream out loud, and Dana mentioned it, to this person who got a hold of herself and did what she had to do. She's 17 years old. Like that is amazing for a, a, as a survival story. And she needed those hands to show that her father was dead so she could keep the property. Like this is an amazing story to me. Um, anyway, so my question is, do you think Granick really was responsible for that scene in the lake where it seemed like in 30 seconds, you see the change between the, the stoic, you know, the scream where 
where she's a 17 year old and she wants to just scream out to the world how horrible this is, this thing that she has to do. And in the next moment, she does what she has to do to save her family and her home. Is that, is it really Granick? Or is it Jennifer Lawrence or is it both? Like that one scene will stay with me for a long time in the movie, just as it did in the book. Well, thank you, Roseanne. Um, I, I would say that, um, first, let me say that uh, you gave me credit for two things that I don't, I don't deserve credit for. Um, the first is uh, we covered this movie this week because Jacob suggested it. It's true. I ultimately put it on the schedule, but um, I have to say that it, I wouldn't have thought of it if Jacob hadn't uh, suggested it. So uh, he gets credit for that. And Dan, I made the point that, and you said that at the point about the performance. Right. Um, thank you. I, thank you, Jacob. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do, I do, uh, knowing what I know, obviously not having been on set and all that, knowing what I know about the filmmaking process and knowing where Jennifer Lawrence was in her career at this point, um, I don't think it's any slight to Jennifer Lawrence to say that I would think that it would be the director's job. It would be Deborah Granick's job. And I would imagine given her the skill I've seen her exhibit in her direction of a number of movies, um, it, it fits with that, my sense of her as, as a director, that she would have she would have suggested that a change has happened. You know, a, um, a director that actors like to work with and, and Granick seems to, to fit that bill, um, wouldn't give an actor, even a, a young, relatively inexperienced one, a quote unquote line reading. They wouldn't say, do it like this or say it like this, but they would say, and it is their job to keep the actor, you know, cognizant of where he or she is in the story and where their character is in the moments. Because as we all know, these things are shot sometimes out of order, they're shot over long periods of time and it, that sense of immediacy is, is hard to maintain. So it would seem to me that um, Granick, certainly probably in the screenplay she co-wrote and then certainly I would imagine on set in directing would talk about how there was a transition that has occurred that her character feels differently doing this the second time than she does the first time. And that mm. she's, she's crossed some sort of threshold or undergone some sort of transformation or been impacted by having had to do it once. And she wouldn't do it the same way a second time. And then it probably, you know, and Lawrence manifested that the way she manifested that. Um, Jacob, would, would that be a, a, a similar sense to the way you would, you would anticipate? It does. I think that's well put, Andrew. But one thing that I would add to the discussion of that scene is that part of the reason this scene is as effective as it is for me is because of everything that comes before it. Um, I think this is a you, grotesque and difficult to watch as it is. I think this is a really remarkable scene, um, also from a storytelling perspective and a kind of narrative structure perspective, because it sort of brings all the themes that have been building up over the course of this yeah, film to a head, and it embodies them in images that we can't forget. You know, we've seen Re on this, um, uh, on this quest for her father that's taken her increasingly farther and farther outside of her comfort zone. And then so finally, when it comes time to meet him, she's literally uh, has her face covered and is taken to a mysterious place and taken out, not even onto the land anymore, onto, the, onto a moonlit lake um, to find him. It, it, you know, she's been digging into her family's secrets, um, things that she's not supposed to know. And then so to finally uh, make contact with her father, she literally has to put her hands below the water and touch him. She literally has to pierce the surface. You know, we've seen her, um, we discussed this a little bit uh, previously, but we've seen her, um, staying stoic and staying composed and uh, the rigor with which she's composed herself through the film. And that so when we finally see her let that scream out, even if it's silent, even if it's unspoken, it really means something to us because we understand that it's been there, you know, that it's been, that it's been brewing. So um, I think, um, I think it's, you know, excellent direction by Granick. Uh, why is about the uh, cultural thing? I'm sorry, say again. Um, well, to continue, I think it's um, excellent work by Granick 
excellent work by Jennifer Lawrence. Um, I think the, the source text and the script uh, sets us up for it perfectly. And there's a lot of people who work on making a film, who work on making the light properly evocative, that work on making the music capture the mood. And I think all that uh, is very taught um, in this scene. Uh, and the last hand we have up is Robert. And I don't know if he has another comment or question or if I just forgot to lower his hand at the beginning. So Robert, did you have something else you wanted to, to ask or say? Oh, no, I, I, I had lowered my hand. Thank okay, you. my mistake. Thanks, Robert. Um, thanks everybody for joining us for the discussion of Winter's Bone. Uh, we uh, have a, a number of great programs still coming up. Um, I will say first that uh, in January, beginning in January, we're gonna have a new slate of our remote classroom seminars. So keep an eye out for that. We will also be continuing these online discussions on most Monday nights. Um, we will be taking off December 28th, uh, but we will um, be back here next week. I won't tell you for what, but I will say it will be a very, very different movie and a very, very different discussion than what we had today to find out what we'll be doing on Monday. Uh, I hope you receive our emails. Every Thursday, we uh, send out our education email and it has in it uh, the uh, registration for the discussion, the, the name of the movie, a link to where you can watch it, and perhaps most importantly, a link to the instructor's introduction. So uh, I hope you sign up for our emails and visit BrynMarFilm.org and check out our new movies available only for streaming through our uh, Theater 5, uh, as well as all the other education initiatives we have happening through film studies online. Um, in addition, uh, we have... Um, uh, one of our regulars who would like to make um, an, an additional uh, remark. Uh, Dana, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. All right. So hi to everybody out there, all the thousands of you worldwide joining us tonight. And I do want to say a couple of things. Um, I did a computation today, ladies and gentlemen. This was the 37th Monday night class that we have had together. I have been present for 35 of them and shot my mouth off for most of those 35. So I believe I've gotten a tremendous amount out of this class. And I think many of you do too. I did another calculation. If I were taking this class in at, you know, at the at Brimar Film Institute for about $15 a session, I figured, which is generally how much it would run if we were taking this as, a, as courses, which I did many of, that would have brought the total of these 37, including tonight, to about $555. Now, I don't know about you. I've been making donations, but I haven't been making donations anywhere near that. And it makes me think, wow, we are really being treated in this terrible time to a lot of free, wonderful stuff. And I'm just talking about our Monday night gathering. I'm not even talking about all the great things that these people put on their website each week. And I'm sure others of you are probably taking advantage of. So I hope that everyone will join me tonight because I, I hang my head. And I also want to say my husband is sitting next to me. So that $550 should be really like times two. So I would like you to join me because tonight I'm going to go back with my head hanging and um, donate a lot more money because I think that, that we are experiencing a joyful thing here. So have a wonderful holiday season. And before you spend all your money on your families, send a little bit more along with me to Bryn Mawr Film Institute. Thank, Thank you, you, Dana. This is Jean. Um, you've inspired me. Thank you for saying that. Good points made. Thank you so much, Dana. Um, what you have identified as your um, uh, shooting your mouth off, so to speak, uh, obviously made an impact in those last remarks and makes an impact in all of our discussions. I heard so many people uh, tonight referencing your remarks and, and how they informed it further informed their view of the film. Um, that is one of the great joys of doing this, that we all learn while doing this. We learn from each other. Hopefully you learn from me and my colleagues. 
And uh, we're so glad to be able to bring this programming and all the other programming uh, that we do to you. And, and my, my colleagues uh, enjoy their roles in it as much as I do mine. Um, I just get the extra fun part and Jacob and I get the fun part of actually talking to folks. Um, so until next time, hopefully we'll see you next week for our last uh, discussion of 2020. Um, and if we don't see you next week, because you have a holiday goings on, uh, we look forward to certainly seeing you in 2021. We'll be back and, and doing this. Uh, and we're glad you can join us. Thanks so much, everybody. Great.